Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. This is actually the first video I've made in a while because I had surgery on my right hand and it put me out of commission. So the videos you've been seeing on the channel, both channels actually, were ones that I made before the surgery on my hand. I've been giving updates to my patrons about the progress of what's been happening with the hand and recovery and stuff. There's even a funny video from me waking up uh, after the operation in the hospital. So if you want to see that stuff, uh, if you're a patron, you can go check that out on the uh, post feed there. On today's video, though, I'm going to be following up from last weekend's video. I'm going to be fixing this Commodore 64, and I'm going to try to do it entirely with this very inexpensive scope that I reviewed on last week's video. $60 all in shipped for this, and we're going to see if that's going to be good enough to fix this machine. Last week, I only looked at like kind of theoretical performance of this oscilloscope here and not actual use case on a real machine. I won't be using the $3,000 National Instruments virtual bench that I normally use. And if during the repair of this motherboard, I need a multimeter, I'm not going to use my EV blog one. I'm going to use this one, Anang AN8008. I think this thing was $20 or maybe it was 30. I've had it for a few years. It's a very inexpensive multimeter, but it's actually pretty good performing, all things considered. I'm not sure I will need it though, because typically the oscilloscope is all you really need to do troubleshooting on a board like this. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, this is the 64 board I'll be working on today. This one also comes from Henning, as were the last batch of them. I had done some testing at some point when I opened these, I think, and I wrote for this one, number four, black screen with and without the dead test, no SID, burning up RAM. Hmm, okay, so this one might be an easy fix. All right, unlike the blowtorch motherboard, uh, this one, it looks like to be in really, really good shape. I'm actually not seeing any rework whatsoever on it. And on the front side, this is one of the very latest versions of the short board. So when I say short board, it means that Commodore consolidated a lot of chips into the larger PLA chip here. So you notice this thing has way more pins than the earlier one. And it's even more consolidated than the earlier version of this short board in that this had a color RAM chip off to the side and Commodore actually went and integrated right into the PLA for this particular board. The date on the PLA is 1991, as is the date on the ROM chips. Ooh, and this 6526. So <laughs> 1982, the 64 came out, and this was getting near the very end of the run. The top of this capacitor here is a little bit torn up. This thing was obviously stacked at some point, but that shouldn't really cause any kind of issue. And if it, if it is a problem, I can just replace it. Okay, so as I indicated in the note, the RAM is burning hot. And that really does seem to be a very common thread on these short boards. I am not sure if we've had one with a burning up RAM in this series yet, like this recent batch of repairs, but I know for sure I have fixed short boards with that problem. So before I actually do any further testing, I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say that this board probably works perfectly once we replace both of these RAM chips. But this is more about testing the hand tech here. So uh, let's see how the signals look, uh, at least on the two RAM chips with this thing powered up. If you're interested in knowing more about my specific thoughts on this scope, I recommend you uh, check out this first video, which actually I just posted today. If you haven't watched the video on the hand tech and you don't intend to, I'll just give a really short version here, $60 scope, very inexpensive, but surprisingly capable for the price for only $60. A lot of the really inexpensive scopes you see floating around the internet, the ones that are like $10, $20, they're junk. They're not useful for this type of work, trying to fix a board that runs at one megahertz or two megahertz, like a 64. You need something a little bit more capable than that. And something like this Handtech actually should be able to do the business. But I haven't actually done repairs with it yet. So of course that's what we're gonna be doing here. In the video on the scope, I talked about how the software that came with it is, has a lot of shortcomings and some idiosyncrasies that are really annoying. Well, it turns out that there is an open source piece of software that can actually run the scope. And it's this, Open Handtech 6022. It's designed specifically for this oscilloscope. 
And what's even more cool is that this software works on Linux, Mac, and Windows. So if you are a non-Windows user and you want to use this $60 scope, no problem. Just use this open source software. When I first took a look at the project, I was surprised that the software looks actually quite a bit better than the, uh, the software that comes with the scope. Plus, it's, of course, maintained and updated. And Open Hand Tech has quite good and thorough documentation, which I recommend you check out. One of the things that I talked about in the first video about this scope is that the triggering is really inadequate. And after reading about this a little bit on certain forum posts and actually on this project, the reason why is evident. This thing has no hardware triggering built in. The Handtech scope entirely relies on software for triggering. Basically, it, it looks like this device just digitizes the signal and then takes that digitized signal and streams it over the USB cable. It doesn't have any RAM or buffer memory in here, unlike the Virtual Bench, which does have sample memory built into the scope. So what you're looking at on the screen of the computer is just the relevant portion that you're interested in. And of course, the virtual bench, like a regular bench scope, and I'm pointing up to my Rigol scope there, has actual hardware triggering, where when you set up the trigger thresholds, that is happening in hardware. So you're gonna get really quick and accurate triggering, not reliant on software to do the triggering, like with this. But that's what enables this thing to be so cheap. To get rid of that hardware triggering on the two channels makes this thing very inexpensive. And this is it. This is Open Hand Tech running right now. Uh, a couple cool things about it, you can actually alter the calibration output. The default is one kilohertz. We're now looking at a 100 kilohertz signal. In addition, it has this split view, which I really like. So this top view is actually what's being streamed over USB. And then you can see the cursors here, and that's basically zoomed in on this lower section here. And I can use the keyboard and the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. And notice it, it actually stays on the trigger point as it zooms. Um, I do have the persistence mode turned on. So there we go, notice it's moving a little more jittery like, and I think that's because the frequency generator running at 100 kilohertz is just not that stable of an output. But you turn that on, it's kind of like a little bit of persistence. In the split view, which you can turn off by clicking on the little magnifying glass here, if I just use the scroll wheel alone, it scrolls around in the waveform, but if I use control, that's when it zooms in and out. What I haven't figured out is a quick way to change the time base other than pushing these up and down arrows which I don't really love. You can actually control the sample rate. From my understanding, reading the documentation, the higher sample rates are actually really glitchy. And we saw that in the official software because it actually ran at 48 mega samples per second and you got really weird results. And even in this, we're seeing that. So at 30 mega samples a second, look how it's all over the place. But if I lower it down to 10, we're getting a much more stable signal. Maybe that's a problem with the USB not being able to transfer enough data. I don't know, but I do have a plug directly into a port on the motherboard. It's not going through a hub or anything, so who knows? In fact, this software, I think, locks out anything over 30 mega samples because it says basically it's unusable, which was what we were seeing with the official Handtech software. At 30 mega samples a second, definitely we're losing data or something over USB because this little glitch here that I've zoomed up on definitely doesn't exist in reality. So let's put that back down to 10, hit play. And while we don't have as much resolution here on this rising edge of this 100 kilohertz signal, we certainly have just overall a more stable data stream. One more thing I'm gonna talk about is the measurement capabilities. And that is on the bottom here. We're at one volt per division. So these are the division lines. We are at around 2.2 volts peak to peak. Uh, 1.45 volts RMS and 100 kilohertz. So there's a the little bit of a frequency counter. Remember that all of this is happening in software. So it's definitely not gonna be accurate, especially if your sampling is causing all that weird glitching, which those higher sample rates do cause. All right, so the motherboard is plugged into a power source. I have a ground lead connected to the ground on the motherboard and I'm ready to start probing. On my PC, here's the pinout for the RAM chips. And of course the scope is running. Okay, I'm on pin two, which is the first of the four data bits that are on each of these chips. So each of these chips has 64 kilobytes in them, but only four bits. So that's why you have two chips to get a total of 64K across eight bits. So let's turn this on. So we're getting activity and I'd say that that looks okay, but then I'm on pin three and this looks really bad. Pausing it, it looks like something is trying to hold the data bus high or it's, it's falling very slowly. 
Back on pin two, this is a little bit more how it should look. Kind of goes high and then low with these little glitches, which are normal. I'm on pin 17 here, which is data bus three, and there's pretty much nothing happening there. And then this one here is pin 15, and notice how low it is. So peak to peak, 2.4 volts, that's completely wrong. So whatever's trying to drive the bus here, which is probably the CPU, is being held much lower than it should. Now let's look at the other pins on this other chip here. Uh, we're getting 3.36 volts peak to peak. It's also getting very hot. Uh, that pin here, which is, ow, sorry, that's burning my finger. Uh, that pin there looks bad. Okay, this one here is also 2.9 volts. And this one here is 3.44. Let's look at this one. I didn't even notice that. Yeah, 3.6. I don't know, all of these are really low. Um, this one looks really screwy. This one's not so bad. Peak to peak is 4.23, but uh, we're getting all this weird kind of droopy stuff, which on this one, we are not getting. Uh, so yeah, hot chips like this, probably what's happening is the CPU or other things is trying to drive the bus like the ROM chips. And these RAM chips are just shorting those lines directly to ground. I don't think the heat that we're getting out of the two RAM chips is only coming from the fact that they are shorting the data bus lines. Well, I'm theorizing they're shorting the data bus lines down to ground because whatever's driving the bus, like if it's the CPU or the ROMs, duh, there's not much current in that. So if you just create a short circuit there, you're not gonna get super hot chips. And the CPU and the ROM chips themselves aren't that hot. Now, shorting the outputs of chips completely to ground is not good for them. So this actually could damage things like the CPU or the ROM chips. So it's better to not run the machine too long while it's in this state. But sometimes you need to run it long enough to figure out which chips are shorting it to ground. Okay, so for methodology to see if these RAM chips are causing this uh, five volt signal here on the data bus to be all the way down here <laughs> around 2.8 volts, is we are going to cut the leg on one of these. So just get some really uh, sharp snips like this, flip them over, and I'm just gonna cut pin two, which is data line zero. And the reason why cutting like this isn't a bad idea is because it's not difficult to put a blob of solder to reconnect that if you're wrong. As soon as I cut it, the pin sort of pulled away from the chip there. So it should not be connected anymore. So now if I put the scope back on there on the motherboard side and we turn this on, okay, and look how different the signal looks now. Now I know it's jumping around a lot. Uh, let's pause this, see if I can get it where there's actually a waveform there. Oh, you know, I'm gonna adjust the trigger a little higher. Play, there we go, look at that, four volts peak to peak. Oh, and the software crashed. All right, and we're back. So it's not the most stable. It did say on the GitHub repo that it's really thoroughly tested on Linux. Windows is kind of not so much testing and on OS X or Mac OS, it's uh, really not tested at all. So we turn this on again. There we are, four, four volts peak to peak. Don't worry about this middle part. That is just because the data line is floating. There we go, look at that, that looks great. Far better than how it looked before with it connected to the RAM chip. Now, if I touch on the top part of the pin on the RAM chip, of course, all we're gonna see is it down around ground, but let's do the same thing on the next pin. Okay, so it's looking like that. Uh, let me adjust this trigger level here up a bit. All right, so it's um, actually not looking terrible. I don't think this line is actually shorted because uh, take a look here. Uh, see these signals here? They're actually decent. I mean, it's not up to four volts, but it's nearly at four volts, let's pause it. So yeah, there it is, 3.84. So I don't think that pin is actually a problem, but let's find another one that looks bad and shorted. Uh, this one looks weird, but it's still going up all the way here to four point something volts. So I don't think that is a problem. Okay, 17, that's another bad pin. Oh, we're not getting anything there on either of them. Okay, so that pin, I may be just a dead short. Let's check this one. Okay, this one here. This looks really low and bad. See, there we go, 2.4 volts. That is pin 15, let's cut that pin. All right, turn back on, there we go. Looking much, much better now. Of course, it's hard for this thing to trigger on there, but we are still getting, when I pause it with an actual signal, come on. Oh, I keep pausing it at the wrong time. 
Give me something to stop on. I really wish there was a single shot button that just did like one capture, but there doesn't appear to be. Anyhow, you saw there for a second, I just turned it off that we were getting the full height uh, all the way up to like four point something volts. All right, next pin I wanna test is this one, which is pin 17 and that's giving almost nothing. How about on this chip here? We're almost getting nothing. Let's just cut that pin and let's see if that, if that returns to something. Actually, we're gonna need to do it on both chips. I think it might be shorted on both of them. All right, and we hit play on the, yep, and look at that, see it jumped right up. Remember this was stuck all the way down around ground and now we're up around 4.58 volts. We're not getting a lot of activity on it, if I turn the power off and on, but I think that's okay. Anyhow, I think that pretty much confirms that these two chips are the problem. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna show the method for getting chips out, the safe way of doing it without causing any damage. Just cut all the legs on them with these side cutters and that's gonna free up the entire um, body of the chip. And then we could just use the soldering iron to pull out the pins. And then we just have to clean up uh, what's on the motherboard. This is by far the safest way to get chips out. And if you know they're bad, like these hot chips, then it is the way to go. And unless you're 100% sure of what you're doing getting chips out, uh, I would always use this method. There it is. So that's it. So the chip has been removed. What's left is just the pins. We just do this one as well quickly. And there we go. Both of the bad RAM chips have been cut out, just leaving the legs. For removing the pins from this, I'm gonna use this, the Pine Sill uh, Direct Heat Soldering Iron. It's USB-C powered. I have a video on this. It's $25 for this thing. I really, really recommend it. And if you order one, please don't forget to order one of these. It's a silicone USB-C cable. These are really flexible, and plus they don't burn very easily either. <laughs> Regular ones will burn because they have PVC coatings and they're stiff. So get one of these. They're on their website. They're pretty cheap as well. I'll put a link in the description to the review I have of this. So check that out if you haven't seen it. But basically, I have this set for around 350 degrees. Grab some tweezers and then you just heat up the pin and then you just pull them out one by one. When you've heated the pad enough, the pin just slides out super easily. There's no resistance or anything and if there is, then you haven't heated it enough. One other thing to consider is when you're cutting the chip away, make sure you cut the pin up near the body of the chip and not down by the motherboard because if you don't cut it down by the motherboard, you're not gonna give yourself anything to grab onto. Well, with the tweezers, that is. Also, the ground pins can be a little tough sometimes, so turn up the heat a little if you need to for these ones. Uh, maybe push the boost feature on the soldering iron, and then you should be able to free it. All right, another tip is it's easier sometimes to turn the motherboard around 180 degrees to do the other row of pins. All right, so one of the pins I accidentally cut too low, so I'm gonna have to try to get it out from the other side. That was my mistake, uh, which I just warned you about. Even I did it. Okay, all the legs are out, there they are. Uh, the one that was cut too low, what I had to do is on the back side of the motherboard, I had to push it this direction through the top because it's wider on the top side when it connects to the chip. So you can't push it through the via that way. You have to push it um, through the motherboard, but there wasn't enough to grab on this side. So on the back side, I heated it up and using the tweezers, I pushed it up and then I was able to grab it on this side. Now, so okay, so the pins are out, but there's still solder in all the holes. We gotta clean that up so we can get a socket in, right? Couple ways to do that, well three actually, you can use uh, braid, you can use a pump, a hand pump, or you can use a desoldering pump like the Hakko 301, which I normally use. That thing's like $300, so it's certainly not cheap if you're just doing a one-off machine. 
braid is like this stuff here. Uh, this is MG Chem uh, braid or uh, solder wick. I barely have any left, so I'm gonna run out shortly. Um, this is really good. I do recommend this, but avoid the cheap stuff. Get the good name brand stuff. It works a whole lot better. And then this right here is a hand pump. These actually work quite well too. I think if you get good at these, this is the solder, solder pult, uh, then they work well. But I personally, I'm not very good at using these. So I kind of struggle with them. I, I do better with the wick. Why don't I give the pump a try? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add fresh solder to all of these holes, or at least a few of them. All right, here we go. I'm gonna heat up one of these and then try to suck it out. Oh, that worked. Okay, so I just gotta reprime it. Next one. Oh, okay, all right, this thing is working great. Again, just like removing the pins, the ones that are on the uh, ground plane or the five volt plane are gonna be more difficult. So I kind of recommend, uh, you definitely have to put a lot more heat into those first. So I'm just gonna add a good blob of solder onto these. So I'm gonna use the boost to really get some good heat into there. And then here we go, let's try it. That did not work. Try again. Okay, I think I got it. Let's try this one up here. Boost, by the way, is holding a button down. It goes up to like 420 degrees Celsius. Uh, gets a lot of heat into it. Ah, that was my fault, I missed. Let's try again. Nope. There we go. Oh, that, I got it. Let's try this one here. Nope, not successful. This is where the Hakko 301 I normally use would make super quick work of these. And for me, who does this a lot, it's totally worth it. Look at that, I am unable to get this one to, to do it. It's just, you gotta get enough heat into it so that it stays molten long enough to, for me to take the tip of the soldering iron off of it. And then, uh, you know, then it sucks it up into this solder pulse here. Look at this, I'm still here trying. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, it's created a little like, <laughs> a little like a mountain of solder there as it tried to get it out. Yeah, that's really frustrating. For my sanity, I'm gonna move on to these other ones, which will be a lot easier. Obviously, when you're using something like this, you get practice and then it becomes a lot easier to do. And I just don't have a lot of practice because I just don't have a lot of need for it because I have the Hakko 301. And that's what I use. Okay, so everything is done except for these two, which I think it's five volts, and these at the top, uh, these four pins there, those are ground. Actually, you know what? I'm just gonna try with the wick. Maybe that's gonna work better. Now you might be saying to yourself, why is this so hard? Well, it's just because it is. <laughs> and that's why specialized tools like the Hakko exist to make this doable. Look at that, that actually made quick work of that using the boost um, temperature on here plus the wick. So I guess this is a good method for uh, getting these ground ones out. Nope, that one did not work though. Heat is your enemy on the ones that go to traces. 
And that's because it's very easy to lift those. But these ground plane ones, it's a lot less risky. So you don't have to be as careful uh, with these ones. Ugh, see, this is not easy. Okay, I think it's done. This one looks like it's cleared out on the top, but not down at the bottom. So I'm going to try again. Just add some fresh solder into there. Okay, there we go. I think those top four are done. Let's do these bottom ones. So it looks like it's done. It's a little crusty because the, this has flux in it. So that gets on the board. So you just have to clean that off with some alcohol. What you gotta do now is I just need to check the backside and the backside looks great. So I think we're good to go put, to put sockets in there. It's gonna clean this up first. Put a little bit of 99% IPA, get something like an old toothbrush and just uh, clean that up. Get all that extra flux off and then it also gives you a good uh, opportunity to take a look at it with a little magnifying glass or something. Just spray on the alcohol and then I recommend you take a little bit of paper towel and you just sop it up basically. So any kind of flux residue that's left behind, you should hopefully get on there. You'll see a little bit of brown. And we'll just do that on the back as well. So there we go, two RAM chips removed. Now I always use these types of sockets, these round hole types. You can get these from AliExpress or eBay very inexpensively, but you could use any socket. Uh, those are too big. I personally prefer this kind of socket over this kind, which are like the double wipe ones, just because I feel it's a little harder to damage these. These can actually get damaged relatively easily because they're kind of cheaply made these days. If you install this in the board and then you put a chip into it that you've previously desoldered from the board, the, the legs are a little covered in solder. They're not perfectly smooth. I've actually had these get damaged and I had to take them out and put new ones in and it's a real pain in the butt and I really don't like to do it. So these type, that doesn't happen, but this type is actually harder to get chips into because the holes are less forgiving than these, these dual wipe ones. You have to have everything aligned just perfectly. But for me, I find in the long run, these I prefer, but I think it's personal preference, which you will use. All right, so the two sockets are in and they're loose. You see, they just move around very easily. If I flip the board over, these are just gonna fall out. So of course you can just put a piece of tape across it. I like to use this, which is blue tack. I just keep some handy near the bench. And I just basically push it down on top of the sockets like that that keep them in. I just solder a couple of pins on the outside. So I'll do like one right here and I'll do one on the other side as well. And that's just to hold it in place and I'm gonna pull the blue tack off. And then I'm just gonna double check that the socket is completely flush against the board. So there we go. Now I can just take that off. If I solder these middle pins with this in there, it kind of melts the blue tack. I don't recommend that. So now what I'm doing is I'm holding this socket with my fingers. I'm holding on that pin and that pin so I don't burn my fingers. And I'm just gonna melt the solder again and I'm just gonna push the socket into the board and it was all the way in. I'm just making sure that it's flush against the PCB. And the same for this, that one, that one. Okay, we're good. And now I'm just gonna re-solder all the rest of the pins and it does help to get a little length of solder. I just burned that off just as it's easier to handle. So I'm just gonna go through these. Again, 350 degrees and reattach all the pins. There we go, I'm all done. It's a good time now to inspect your work. Use something like this, a little eye loop. You can get these from eBay, AliExpress, Amazon, wherever for just dollars. This is like a cheap version of it. There's expensive ones, but this was literally like $2. So those are great for also inspecting traces and stuff. Uh, you should have inspected the traces first before installing the sockets again. I took a close look, everything was perfect. And the final thing you might wanna do is notice there's some flux on the board here just because that was rosin core solder. So again, I'm just gonna put on a little bit of IPA there. I'm gonna use the toothbrush here, just sort of get that off. This cleaning part is completely optional. It doesn't hurt it to leave it. Uh, it just looks nicer in the long run. And again, I'm just dabbing uh, with a paper towel here to get up any of that flux residue. Cleaning it just makes it look nicer in the long run. If someone's looking at the board in the future, 
they won't see some really ugly <laughs> rework has been done. I can still tell that I hand soldered this versus the rest of the board, which was wave soldered or whatever it was done when it was manufactured. You could still tell a human did this, not to mention on this side, of course, you're gonna see two sockets there. So Commodore doesn't use that, but uh, yeah, a little cleaning goes a long way. And now to reinstall some fresh RAM chips that I know work. And even before we plug in video to see if this thing is working, why don't we use the oscilloscope here to check those data bus pins, see how they look. So here we are on pin two, data bus line zero. And that looks much better. Peak to peak, over five volts. Next one, same thing, lots and lots of activity. And if we go onto this side, they're looking really good. We're on data bus line three. And this is data bus line two, also looking perfect. And we'll just check the other chip. I mean, it's gonna be the same. Good, good, that is good. And that is good. And like, just let's take a look at this app here. If I hit pause, we're getting really nice signals out of this uh, cheap oscilloscope. I'm, I'm really impressed. This, this piece of software works so much better than the official Handtech stuff. Of course, if we touch those chips, they're not even warm at all. They're just cold to the touch. Even without any video output connected to this thing, we could look at the signaling on the VIC-2 chip here to make sure that we're getting what looks like a good video signal. And we can look for that line on the 64 that you get when you first turn it on, that during a black screen, all you'll get is a line. But once it starts to display text and other stuff, you'll start to see other parts of the signal. So I have up here, 65, 67, it's, it's, it's a similar, it's a different part number to this, but that is the VIC-2. Pin 15 is the Luma signal, so that's what we need to look at. 19, 18, 17, 16, 15. And there it is, I've adjusted the trigger, so it's triggering off of the white line, and this rocks, this software is unbelievably better. See this constantly changing information here? That's because we're looking at one scan line here with this capture. So that spike and then that data is one scan line. Well, it's triggering off random scan lines. So of course, as it goes down the screen, you're gonna have parts that are just solid blue and then you have parts with text. So it's gonna be constantly changing. If we turn the machine off and back on, we're gonna see the line which appears while it has a black screen and then it's gonna start drawing content. And here we go. There it is, there's the line. And there it is. Uh, this is the border right here on one side and the border on the other side. And normally it's that darker blue color and the text is lighter blue. So anytime you see the little peak there, in fact, if we pause it, hopefully we're gonna get, nope, that's just uh, the solid border at the top or bottom. Uh, let's see, if, hopefully we can get one where we have text. Of course, the text when you just first boot up is only at the top. There is the text. So this is part of the scan line that's making up the text. And this cheap scope allows you to perfectly see that we're getting a good video signal out of this machine and we do not have a black screen. And this is before I've even hooked up a monitor to it. Alrighty, so I'm gonna hook up a video output cable that goes into the retro tank. And I think I'm capturing the right input. So here we go. Maybe, there, there we go. And it works. Without a doubt, bad RAM chips. I think the, the fact that they were hot gave away the fact that these were bad, but I want to show the entire troubleshooting process of validating that those were causing the problem and cutting those pin legs showed us as soon as we cut it, the signal started returning to normal, kind of validated the fact that those specific chips were causing the problem. If they weren't hot and I had no idea, what I could do is look at one of the data bus lines that didn't look right and I can start cutting a line on every chip that's connected to it. You gotta look at the schematics for that until you find the one that's bad. This machine seems to be working. So what I need to do is get a, a SID chip in here and plug in the test harness. I've mentioned this before that you don't need to use the test harness or the diagnostic cartridge if you don't have one. If the computer is booting up to basic, then just use it. And hopefully it's gonna be working perfectly and then you're good. This is just a way for me to quickly validate that all the functions of the machine are working. In case there's anything else that's wrong, I can go work on fixing it. Keep in mind, if you're running the diagnostic cartridge and you don't have the harness connected, you are gonna come back with errors. Oh, and actually look at that, I got some errors already. Now with the Commodore 64, the cassette, which is connected to this port right here, 
is actually driven partially from the CPU and I think one of the two 6526s, although I'm not completely sure about that. I have to go check the schematics to see that. So the reason why it's saying the CPU is big ha bad is because I don't think this cassette is working correctly, but it could easily be a bad connection on here or the cable wasn't plugged in all the way, it wasn't. So let me just push those down. Um, the reason why actually now I think about it that it was saying one of the 6526s is bad is because the diagnostic harness is connected to the user port and the user port is driven from the 6526s. So it's trying to say that it sees a cassette port problem, but it's not totally sure if it's a user port problem or if it's the CPU not driving the cassette port properly. Let's turn this on. And actually we're not getting an LED flash on there and that should happen uh, when you first turn on the machine. So I might have to do a little bit of troubleshooting, but I don't think the cassette is actually gonna work on this machine as it is right now. Now, one thing to consider, if you were working on this board and the cassette didn't work and you don't use the cassette port, it doesn't really matter. Like you don't need to try to fix it. Um, yeah, it's coming back with a bad interrupt as well, which is why 6526. Keep in mind, these diagnostics are really inaccurate and it says stuff is bad on here. I think I've showed this on previous videos where it totally was pointing to the wrong thing as the problem. All right, let's find the schematics for this board. We're here on Zimmer's. We have the PCB assembly number down here, 250-469, and the PCB number 252-311. 252-311, and here it is, corrected rev B. Let me quickly find the cassette port. There it is right here. So we got five volts. Uh, we got a sense pin. Notice that's running down here into the MPU, which of course is the CPU. It is connected here to this line, which is going here to the 65, 26, the flag pin, but keep in mind, I do have a loopback connector connected right here to the IEC port, and it was happy with that. So I don't know if it's actually connected to pin one there. Cassette read. The cassette reading seems to happen through SRQ in. So they share that pin and that does go through here, but the motor control, that does not appear to be working. This LED, which has a current limiting resistor here, comes into pin three. The LED turns on when the tape motor is instructed to turn on. Pin 24 is the one that actually turns on the motor. So there's unregulated nine volts and two transistors here. So this is actually a, a switch to turn on the voltage to the motor, which is what's happening here. This is the sense line here. So this one right here. So I should be able to see pin 24 changes when you first turn the machine on because this is going to basically be spinning the motor a little bit. Ooh, let's just grab the multimeter. Oh, this is all tangled together, you know? <laughs> it's like your old headphones before we use Bluetooth headphones. Oh, it's getting tangled up. <laughs> One, two, three, four. Okay, so this is set to volts. Let me turn it on. Yeah, weird. 3.1 volts and starts at zero though. Hmm, that's weird. I don't, I've never really looked at this circuit. So I'm not sure if that's how this should be working. So this pin right here is what goes to the LED and there's a dropper resistor and that's what turns on when the motor is being told to turn on. And when I turn on the power of this machine, like right now, that LED does not light up. So basically this motor on signal, which does come from the CPU and it goes through a couple transistors, wherever they are on here, um, that's not working. That's not to say the CPU is bad. It could be something with that circuit. Now, when we follow this circuit through, we end up at R3 right here. That goes to the CPU. I should lift that pin. I'm gonna lift this resistor off the board and that's gonna break the connection between the CPU and that circuit. So I can actually try to drive that circuit directly with five volts or zero volts, and we'll see if the motor turns on, the motor signal turns on. If it's not being driven properly because the CPU is damaged, then we know that CPU is bad. But if it doesn't turn on, even when I give it five volts or I give it ground, then we know for sure the problem exists with that circuit and the CPU is probably fine. So when we take a look at the circuit here, we have Q1 and Q2, there's Q1, there's Q2, there's the resistor, there's CR1, which is the Zener diode right there, six point, or is it 5.8 volts, I think? It's hard to see, it's a little voltage regulator, so to speak, so that's part of the circuit as well. So let me just tone out which side of the resistor goes to the CPU here, I think it's pin 24, or 25, 24, it's that side. 
And that's the side I am gonna lift off the board. There it is, I just heated it up and pulled that out. So the CPU is no longer connected. Let's go back to the oscilloscope just because we can, because <laughs> we have it. Uh, let me test that pin right there coming from the CPU. I'm gonna turn this on. All right, no, we're getting, I mean, it's noisy, but that's okay. Uh, what are we getting? 4.25 volts here. That indicates to me that the CPU is working fine, that this problem exists in this circuit right here for the cassette. So I'm gonna clip this clip lead onto the left side of this resistor. This is the side that normally goes to CPU. And I'm gonna turn the power on and I'm gonna short this to ground. And we're not getting the LED turning on. And I'm pretty sure that should be happening. Taking a look at the oscilloscope here on the side of the resistor that's facing the circuit, obviously grounding it doesn't really do anything. So let's give it five volts and see if anything happens. Nope, we're getting a lot of voltage drop. We're at 700 millivolts, and that's across this 1K resistor. Something is shorted. One of, the, one of these parts is shorted, and uh, we're gonna use the cheap multimeter here to figure that out. So let's uh, put that on ohms, and it is. So let's see about this one here. So emitter, collector, base. Let's... Nope, that's not shorted. The big one is fine. How about this little guy here? Nope, that seems fine as well. Definitely in continuity mode. No, no shorts. What doesn't make sense to me is the right side of the resistor is going to this pin here on, uh, what is this, Q2? And the other pins aren't shorted. So why, when I hook five volts up to that, do we only get 800 millivolts because we're getting so much voltage drop? The transistor here is acting as if it's shorted. I'm a bit perplexed at what's happening here. So I think I'm gonna remove this transistor here. Uh, what is that, Q2, 2SC1815. I'm just heating up with a soldering iron. Again, a, a good way to get this out is you just heat two pins up at once and you kind of tilt it out and then heat up the other pins to try to get it all out. There we go. So it kind of mangles the pins up a little bit, but you can get that out. To continue with the theme of testing with cheap stuff, I'm gonna use this part tester. I've had this forever. <laughs> the battery's so old. Uh, you just hook things up to it and it can test components. And I found it to be relatively reliable. Of course, this does the testing out of circuit. So there we go, I've clipped that on. Yeah, there we go. An NPN transistor. That looks fine. I guess I'm very confused at what's happening here. Okay, I think what I'm gonna do next before I put that part back in, let's see what we're seeing for our voltage right here between R1 and CR1. I think we should be seeing, uh, I think it says plus 5.8 volts there. It's kind of hard to read. Well, we should be seeing that there. No, we are getting 1.15 volts. I don't totally understand that. All right, so since that transistor is good, I put it back in the board. The problem lies somewhere else. Now, I just realized on Q1, which is this large package here, we should be seeing unregulated nine volts, which I think is something like 10, 11, 12, 13. So we should be seeing that on the collector there which is the middle pin, so we turn this on. Okay, so there it is on the collector, 13 volts, that's fine. Now on the emitter, uh, because it's not working, right? I think when I tested earlier, I, I saw nothing. Oh, uh, wait, what? 6.4 volts DC? Wait, what? Uh, so the resistor is still disconnected, so I guess, wait a second. I think that's what it should be. Uh, this is a little bit of a voltage regulator of sorts. It's using this, this larger uh, Q1 package here to regulate this unregulated down to, I guess, about six volts. Wait, I I'm sure I tested this before and I was not getting 6.4 volts. I, I'll have to review footage. I don't remember if I recorded that or not, but uh, okay, so wait a second. So at this point, if I connect up this, which has the LED on it that, wait, did you see that? It blinked, the power's off. Let's turn the power on. Wait a second, <laughs> the LED is on. What, what is happening? Let me connect this clip lead here to the resistor that normally goes to the CPU. And when I ground this, nothing happens. But when I touch five volts, it shuts off the motor. It's working now. I didn't do anything. I literally removed this transistor. I tested it. 
and then I put it back in the board and now this thing is working. What? <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. Okay, I'm gonna reconnect the resistor back to the CPU and theoretically we should have a working tape circuit now, magically. So if I plug this back in, now the resistor is connected. What should happen is when I power on the machine, we should see the light come on for a second and then it goes off. Like that. This doesn't make sense. The machine has fixed itself. I have to think that this, this transistor here is marginal and heating it up, removing it and then reinstalling it in the board has resulted in it just magically working. While editing, I realized another possibility that could have caused this problem. That unregulated nine volts there might not have been working and maybe in my manipulation that started working like maybe the fuse wasn't in there properly or something was wrong over on the side of the board by the power switch. On this type of board, the only other thing that I'm aware of that uses that supply is the SID chip, which isn't actually installed in this board. So if that weren't working, maybe the SID would have no audio, but I didn't actually get to testing that. All right, to know for sure, test harness is reinstall and plug the video back in. Let's power this up. The light blinked, so that's implying the cassette is working. So again, I think I talked about this in the last 64 repair video I did, or maybe it was two ago. The diagnostic cartridge can tell you that things are bad, like the CPU is bad or the 6526 is bad. I have a feeling that everything on this test is gonna pass now. Although that interrupt uh, was showing as bad. So um, let's see what happens. All okay, right, cassette passed, interrupt. Okay, there we go. <laughs> everything passed. False readings on the diagnostic, lying. So I think, again, it goes back to what I was talking about with the RAM. Always try to understand the faults. If I had gone removing the CPU and the, whatever it said it was, one of the 6526s was bad, I could have caused more damage to the board. Not to mention if I had cut the legs off those parts, that would have been expensive because those chips are quite valuable now. They're hard to find both of those and they would have both been ruined. So in the end, I didn't exactly figure out what the problem was, but removing that one transistor and putting it back in fixed the problem. So I'm gonna mark on the can of this probably that that is a suspect part. So in the future, if I work on this board or say someone else works on this board and the cassette's not working, I'm gonna hopefully give them the indicator to suspect that that transistor has failed and to replace it and put a new one in. So I think everyone knows what time it is now. It's time for an 8-bit dance party. So I'm just reconnecting my speakers to the bird's nest of wires that I have down here because I have to split the audio signal and send it into the DAC or the ADC that is, so I can record it for everyone to hear. Uh, let's see if this is all hooked up properly. I think it is. All right, keyboard is hooked up. I'll just prop that carefully. Arm SID is in the board. Adrian's tools. And this is a PAL board. I don't think I really mentioned this. So we're gonna hear the music at a slower rate than we're nor normally used to hearing it. And here we go. All right, well, anyways, that is working. <laughs> I think this machine is fixed. It was just RAM in the end, and then a mysterious problem with the cassette port that, who knows? I mean, I wouldn't have even have noticed if it wasn't for the diagnostic cartridge, right? Because uh, without that harness, I would have never tested a cassette drive to know that it didn't work. Whoever has this machine in the future, if it's not me, uh, they may have a cassette drive hooked up to it and want to load an old tape and it wouldn't work. So <laughs> it's working for now. Why don't I go ahead before I forget and mark up here. Uh, which one was it here? Q2, suspect Q2. I know people don't like it when I write on the can here, but believe me, you could just use a little 99% IPA and this modern Sharpie stuff comes immediately right off. All right, summary time. It was my intent with this video to show that it is totally possible to use pretty inexpensive tools to do nice, solid repair work on a Commodore 64. The Handtech $60 oscilloscope, turns out that with that open Handtech software, I'm mighty impressed. That open Handtech software, it did crash a couple times, is much 
much better than the junky software that this thing comes with. So if you have one of these, absolutely stop using that included software and use Open Hand Tech. It is totally worth it. And then it's really the first time in earnest that I used this solder pult. And it worked really well, except for, of course, those ground pins on there. And that's where I ended up using the braid. And I think uh, these aren't that much either, though they're not as cheap as those ones you can find everywhere for like a few bucks. I think this costs like 10 or $20, but it really is a quite a good tool. In between takes while I was copying footage off the camera, I did open this up and clean it out. That's sort of key and why these are so much better than the cheap ones is you can easily just take them apart. You just turn that and this comes right out like that. There's an O-ring on here and I used some silicone grease to basically re-lubricate it inside here and just helps it create a much better seal. You can find these things all over eBay, AliExpress, Amazon as well, these component testers. I've had this for years and years. It was a kit. It works fine. Just get any of these cheap ones and they all work pretty much the same and it's fantastic, works really well. It's great for telling you apart a PMP versus an MPN transistor, for example. And then next up was this, the really cheap multimeter. I've had this thing for quite a while now and I don't know what it even costs right now, but I totally recommend this or any of these really expensive ones. This is a huge step up from like the $2 ones you can get at Harbor Freight here in the US and probably elsewhere like on AliExpress. Those things work and they, they're okay in a pinch, but they're super junky. This thing on the other hand is actually a pretty decent piece of kit considering uh, the low cost of what it actually is. So that's it, a successful fix with cheap stuff and another working Commodore 64. Thank you very much, Henning, for sending these in. It's just, uh, I'm slowly going through them, fixing them, and uh, it's great education, I think, for everyone just to see the typical problems that happen on these and how you go about fixing them. I'll try to put links in the description below to the various things that I have shown here, like the various tools and stuff, if I can find uh, current links. Uh, like I said, check out the video on the Hantech or Hantech if you haven't seen that already, because uh, it's a decent piece of kit for 60 bucks. I'm, I'm mighty surprised. And next up, I wanna thank my patrons. Their names are on the side of the screen. If you wanna become a patron, you can do so at the side uh, of the link, I mean, in the description. As I think I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I do post extra stuff on my Patreon page for my patrons. So like I had updates about my hand surgery, I will have some other surgeries coming up, so they'll get the updates there. Um, but I also post uh, Patreon exclusive videos, just like little off the cuff videos now and then uh, that they get to see. So it's kind of one of the perks and benefits from being a patron, not to mention you get to see videos before they are released to the general public. So if you see comments on videos on my main channel or second channel, it's coming from my patrons. They're the ones who get access to that ahead of time. And hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, all the usual YouTube stuff. Check out my second channel. A subscribe really helps me out if you haven't already subscribed to my channel. And I think I've gone on for long enough. So uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.